Hello, thank you for joining me on Nonsense Entertainment. Today, I don't have anything um, especially fun to talk about with you. Um, my So, uh, growing up, I listened to radio a lot. I was really into radio, so much so that when Howard Stern left like regular radio and went to Sirius, I stayed home from school and faked being sick so I could listen to his whole broadcast. Um, anyway, really into radio. I listened to it forever. And then before I moved up to Washington State, there was this guy named Scott Leisure. Uh, he had a show called Dangerous Conversation that I watched and listened to for a long, long, long time. And uh, when I was up here for the first few years, I really didn't know but like two or three people. And having that company there with me in the form of like a podcast or um you know <clears throat> radio that's just being streamed from florida uh was really nice it was like having somebody there with me it's part of the reason why i wanted to do this and like i sort of started off the show with the idea that i would do a podcast that was just happening while we were playing a game and then offer the audio by itself later on for an any amount donation. I haven't been able to set a lot of that stuff up yet, but that is sort of the idea and it's I'm kind of like pulling myself in a few different directions with the with the YouTube channel and everything to try to get everything a little different and stuff like that. But <clears throat> but really um the reason I'm here right now is be and being real with you is because I found out this morning that Scott Leisure who ran the Dangerous Conversation podcast has passed away. And uh, he was kind of a young guy, um, you know, mid-50s, early 60s, give or take. And uh, and uh, that's really sad to me. Like, the whole reason I'm really into this stuff is because of him. Um, I've had a few conversations with Scott Leisure, um, I used to listen to his show all the time. I called in occasionally. Um, and then most recently, he got his show started back up again, and I sent him a clip to use for the show. And he made me a co-conspirator on his website for his podcast. So <clears throat> let me show you his website here. So this is his website. As you can see, I've had it on the tab. If you watch previous episodes, you'll see that I've had it favorited for a while. But this is uh, this is his channel. I wonder if I can find a picture of him. Um, there I am. This is a picture I sent him if you want to see it. All about me. But uh, let's see. Where is he? If I can't find him here, I can just show a YouTube or a Facebook picture of him. Ah, there he is. Ledger. He's got his life story here. I think I'll read it for you. Um, <clears throat> a sort of a rest in peace in memoriam sort of thing for my boy Scott. Um, Uh, my road to radio started in my wonder years listening to AM Top 40 in the late 60s. I was fascinated by those voices and the fun they were having. My oldest brother actually went to the Connecticut School of Broadcasting when I was 12. The brother actually went to the Connecticut... Oh, 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 oh. The studios were at WDRC in Hatford, the same station I listened to, and he took me there to watch him practice in the studio. He had a good job as an electrician and never pursued a radio career, but I was hooked the moment I saw the chain-smoking disc jockey behind the glass with neon call letters above his head. In high school, I got by barely with grades because I knew I was going to be a DJ. I never even took the SATs. I attended CSB as a, as a senior in high school, and I got my first job as a board up Oh, a board op on a small AM station in Springfield, Mass. So usually when you're a board op, you don't really say much. Occasionally they'll go to you. Um, 
but ba- you're just running like the button bar with all the funny like zing sound effects and you're rolling commercials and uh you're in charge of the oh shit button for when people curse on on air and stuff like that that station was wixy across the hallway the top 40 station had switched to album rock and i was literally 10 feet away from some of the rock jocks i had listened to in high school Eventually, I was hired to do overnights, then evenings, then afternoons. Over a period of six years, I sent my demo, or air check, to a station in Miami, to a station in Miami, and got hired in 87. It was a big pay upgrade and the culture shock at the same time. A year later, I landed in Tampa Bay and got hired to do afternoons at 98 Rock when they were still classic rock. In 1990, everything changed, and I was on a rocket ride doing afternoons on one of the country's most famous active rock stations. Eight years later, I moved to afternoons at WTBT Classic Rock, and that lasted for seven more years before they switched to country. And since I am literally physically allergic to country music, that was not going to last. During that stint at Thunder 103.5, we got the broadcast rights for Buccaneers Radio, and I co-hosted the Rond Barber Show. Um, I don't, I'm not, the, we're not into any of the stuff I'm familiar with yet, and it's already been, like, 15 years, and I haven't even been born. That's how much this guy was doing radio. The following year, I was hired at the studio host for Broadcast Back Near, still upon... Yeah, okay, uh, bro- uh, and hosted many player shows over a seven-year period. During my stint at the Classic Rocker in 2004, I stumbled upon videos and blogs that questioned the official 9-11 narrative. It rocked my naive world. My life would forever change. My intellect and inner voice told me to speak out, and I did. Needless to say, that didn't go over well with the station management. After all, our studios were two miles from MacDill Air Force Base, which was CENTCOM for running those wars. Back in 2011, I was passed over for a talk gig by Cox Radio, but simultaneously I had landed a talk radio show uh, at Radio IO on the net I called Dangerous Conversation. This is where I... This is where I started listening. I was around when Radio IO was built. I was listening back in those days, and I was listening to the first day of Dangerous Conversation. Not only was it a platform for uncensored talk with language and all outside the FCC restrictions, but any topic could be broached without fear of retribution from the management, advertisers, or any program directors. Truly a dream come true for a broadcaster who had those restraints for the prior 21 years. I was truly a kid in a candy store. I only had one rule to live by, don't get sued. In 2014, I have struggled financially and had to let my show and others go as well. And now, five years later, we have relaunched Dangerous Conversation. The bottom line is free speech, and the free flow of information is what propels society, society's people and our species forward. DC, as we call it for short, is a big dysfunctional family full of ideas, opinions, and twisted senses of humor. I guarantee you, if you give our show a listen, you'll be hooked and coming back here on a regular basis. If it's a big controlling institution on planet Earth, we will question it. DC, a broadcast for critical thinkers with dick jokes. To check us out. (laughs) I noticed a few grammatical errors in this, but uh, otherwise, basically right. Um, I wouldn't say that I am a conspiracy theorist anymore. There's some things I'm conspiratorially minded. I used to be a really big conspiracy theorist. Uh, I'd say the biggest thing for me right now is the Graham Hancock stuff. I'm pretty much a conspiracy theorist on that. But uh, you should go to Spotify and type in Dangerous Conversation if you want to hear the shows he's done up until now. I believe there's something like 30 or 40 of them. Um, my clip may appear in one of those, but if not, I'm going to stick in the clip that I sent him at the end. Um, don't judge me. I haven't released it on YouTube because it's not the, the kind of content that I wanted to put up on the YouTube channel for everybody. Um, 
it's very different. <laughs> it's audio only. Uh, so I think I'll have a couple pictures of Scott up while I play it. And uh, yeah, um, God, this is bad. I really shouldn't be playing this clip, but I'm going to play it anyway. So rest in peace, Scott Leisure. Thank you for putting me on the path that I'm on now because of your broadcasts and your conversations with me personally. Um, you're picking your next life right now, and I hope that it's a good one. You've earned it. I should also mention that in the past like five or six years, he won his battle with alcoholism and was no longer drinking. So another another big V for Ledger. We're all going to miss you, man. Especially those of us that knew you kind of even just a little bit. We're going to miss you. Thank you. Rest in peace. About six years ago, when Dangerous Conversation was on the Bubba the Love Sponge Show streaming channel, Scott had a guest on that changed my life forever. He spoke about past lives and what happens when you die. In this, he speaks of going to the spirit realm where you meet your family, talk about your life, and even watch the events of your life with, him, with them guiding you. This led me to hypnotism, and I studied PLR, or past life regression, but I wasn't getting the answers I was looking for. I became a professionally trained hypnotist and finally figured out where these ideas were tied together, and it was within between life regression. When you take somebody to a past life, then to the end of that life, they take you to what happens after. This is where the accounts not only match what Scott's guest explained, but additionally, all other between life regressions I have seen are telling almost identical stories of the place between. You don't find this sort of consistency with other types of studies on this topic. When people die and are resurrected in hospital beds, the pineal gland flushes DMT into their system and they hallucinate for a while as they begin to expire. I believe this is why the cases are always so different. The DMT acts as a truth-hiding serum that lasts long enough to prevent the actual truth to be found unless you fully pass on. Perhaps because mankind is only meant to have an idea of what happens when we die. So nature put in a self-defense mechanism to prevent us from figuring it out. Who knows? I'm now a firm believer in reincarnation, and to me it's the only version of afterlife that makes sense which led me down the next path that began to challenge my preconceived notions on how the world works. Mysticism. Now that I realized I was incorrect about atheism, I have this understanding that there is some sort of web surrounding our universe, and it must operate in certain ways. You can see it in the fractal nature of our universe. You can see it in the similarities between structures. It exists within the phi ratio. The web stretching over our universe is viewable on every level of existence, but how does it work? I found clues to the answer of this in ancient civilizations, and the messages they left behind. If you're a follower of Graham Hancock, the existence of Atlantis is practically guaranteed at this point, as his work and the work of many of his autodidact colleagues stands on its own with practically no refutations. An interesting side note to that is that there is a YouTube channel called Bright Insight where the host makes a very compelling claim to have found the actual location of Atlantis. Atlantis was said to be a highly advanced civilization, but in what way? And why were they so revered? And why were they unable to foresee the natural disaster that led to their demise? Let's assume the work of Graham Hancock is true, and the Atlantis that is void of crystal electricity and flying machines is the real Atlantis. I believe that their advancement was that of a spiritual nature, one of mastery of magic, that has been fragmented and kept secret by the world at large, at the same time as it was stewarded across the world to be archived and protected. This explains the stories of bearded white men with medicine bags climbing from the mouth of a fish to give the people knowledge that exists in almost every civilization, a great many of which also have a mystery school in some form or another which is a place where people were to learn the magic of mysticism. In every mystical practice, you tend to find a type of spell used called a sigil, 
which is essentially a statement of intent in picture form meant to embed itself into your subconscious in order to manifest in the world when you least expect it. And what you see in the first languages of the world are picture texts, hieroglyphics. And even when they spoke, they spoke in symbols. This is something I believe comes directly from the mystics of Atlantis. The pyramid shape or design that we see all over the world from supposedly completely disconnected civilization seems likely to me to also come from the men climbing out of the mouth of the fish. Why is any of this important? Remember what Musashi says in the Book of the Five Rings. To know the way is to know the way broadly and to see it in all things. I see in all things the seven hermetic principles, of which I cannot explain fully, but can give a very brief list. Mentalism, correspondence, polarity, rhythm, gender, vibration, and cause and effect. They seem obvious, but have existed for thousands of years, and a great many of them had to be proven by science. And the only one still yet to be proven by science is mentalism, and it may never be. I believe that this is the most large fragment of Atlantis that we have remaining. If you read the Kabbalion, an in-depth explanation of these laws, as described by the ancients, you find at the very end this interesting line. To try to defy or subvert these laws will result in being torn asunder by the elements. Perhaps this is the cause of the great cataclysm the Atlanteans were subject to. Perhaps this is why Plato insisted it was their greed that caused God to swat them down and force mankind to start again as children with no memory of what came before. One key ingredient to understanding magic is focus. Focus and attention are everything. This is why the Illuminati use the eye. They're magicians. They cast spells to steal your attention and focus and make you less than what you can be. If you truly want them to be taken down, then the best thing you can do is ignore them completely. I'd like to read a segment from The Mystical Kabbalah by Dion Fortune that's pertaining to the information we may have gotten from Atlantis that I think is rather interesting. The exoteric, state-organized section of the Christian Church persecuted and stamped out the esoteric section, destroying every trace of its literature upon which it could lay hands and striving to eradicate the very memory of a gnosis from human history. It is recorded that the baths and bakehouses of Alexandria were fired for six months with the manuscripts from the Great Library. Very little remains to us of our spiritual heritage in the ancient wisdom. Everything that was above ground was swept away. It's only with the excavation of ancient monuments the sands have swallowed that we are beginning to rediscover its fragments. If you feel a call to learn more about magic, I recommend Frederick Xavier on YouTube, who runs a channel called Mind and Magic. I believe this is your birthright, should you accept it. One thing Freder has taught me is laughter keeps the demons away, which is why I created my own channel, Nonsense Entertainment, for dumb jokes. Thanks for your time. Have a drink for those loved and lost. My dad would never preach to me. In fact, he never teach to me the different things that I should do when I'd be here and there. In fact, he said, go on alone. You have ideas of your own. You'll never lose if you will use the others fair and square. That's just as far as he'd advise. Till one day, to my surprise, I went to say that I was going to other lands to live. And as I went to say goodbye, he saw a teardrop in my eye. Said he, my lad, oh, that's too bad. I've some advice to give. Always leave them laughing when you say goodbye. Never linger long about or else you'll wear your welcome out when you meet a fellow with a tear-dimmed eye. You can leave him laughing if you try. When he tells his troubles, interrupt him with a joke. Tell him one he's never heard and he'll declare that it's a bird. When he's giggling good, you know that's the time to turn and go. Always leave them laughing when you say goodbye. Everyone was laughing when a band went by. In the band I played a drum, of course I played it on the bum. Rockefeller heard the band and said, by guy, that's the best I ever heard and that's no lie. He said, I'm going to fill your instruments with money now. He filled the instruments like pills with yellow $50 bills. I was the laughter of the band. 
stand I held the drumsticks in my hand And everyone was laughing when he said goodbye Everyone was laughing as the jay went by The whiskers on his chin were brown I think he came from Tarrytown He stopped to watch a cable car as it flew by Without a horse it seemed to puzzle Cy He walked out to the track to see just how the thing was worked His eye down to the ground He got his whiskers in the cable slot The cable caught his whiskers see And he went to the battery Everyone was laughing when he said goodbye Everyone was laughing as the car flew by The fat man he was trying to sit in to a space he wouldn't fit Sitting right beside him was a real thin guy The fat man had his elbow in his eye The thin man looked and said They ought to charge us by our weight Said Patty, all right, when they do They'll never stop at all for you Squeeze his way in with a vim Squeeze the thin man into him And everyone was laughing when he said goodbye